to fly beyond the speed of sound. A dangerous scientific journey. The building of an airplane like no other, flown by pilots determined to succeed or die trying. Now, breaking the sound barrier on Modern Marvels. October 14, 1947, at a remote base in the California desert, 24-year-old Air Force Captain Charles Chuck Yeager prepared to board an experimental airplane called the XS-1 and try to do what none had done before, fly beyond the speed of sound. You get assigned to a program, you fly. And uh, it really, you don't look at the results down the road. You're gonna fly the airplanes, That's, and we're shooting for the next high step. For decades, the sound barrier loomed as an impenetrable wall against manned flight, pummeling airplanes with violent shockwaves when they approached it, and causing some, like the P-38 Lightning, to lose control in high-speed dives with disastrous results. The sound barrier became the stuff of epic myth. It was not merely a knowledge barrier, but might in fact be an actual physical barrier that we could not overcome. On that day in 47, Jaeger had a physical handicap he was nursing two broken ribs. But as the sun rose slowly over the desert, he told his backup pilot, Bob Hoover, that he was ready to meet the challenge. I asked him if he felt good enough to fly the airplane. There was been no way in the world to keep Chuck out of that cockpit. We're working test pilots, and, and duty enters into it. It doesn't make any difference. You got a job to do it, you do it. Jaeger would be assisted by a B-29 bomber crew piloted by Robert Cardenas, which would carry the XS-1 to high altitude and launch it into the sky. Then Jaeger and his aircraft would hurtle toward the sound barrier and discover what lay beyond. This is going to be it. If it works, we've done it. If it doesn't, well, we're going to be held to pay. The sound barrier. The name alone suggested a force, both strange and sinister. Yet by definition, it is simply the speed at which sound waves travel, about 760 miles an hour at a sea level temperature of 59 degrees, and more slowly at higher altitudes, where the air gets colder. The waves of water produced by the bow of a ship are similar to those in air which flow past a moving plane. At slow speeds, that air is smoothly displaced by a plane's forward motion. But when traveling closer to the speed of sound, in what is called the transonic zone, the waves become more compressed, and those compressions force some of the airflow beyond the speed of sound. The result is a mix of erratic airflow and powerful shock waves, which buffet the plane while impeding its lift and controllability. You can think of waves in water as being equivalent to waves in air. And those are very much like the shock waves that would form over an aircraft. As the shock waves move back and forth very rapidly, you have this separation area that hammers on the part of the airplane. If that happens to be a control surface, you can lose control of the aircraft. The speed of sound can be roughly calculated by the time it takes to hear a noise from a measurable distance. In 1877, Austrian physicist Ernst Mach devised a formula by which the speed of a moving object is divided by the speed of sound to calculate its Mach number. An object moving at the speed of sound has reached Mach 1. In the decades following the Wright brothers' first flight in 1903, scientists theorized that as an aircraft approached Mach 1, the resistance from air pressure would soar toward infinity and tear the airplane apart. But in an age when propeller planes flew with speeds far below the sound barrier, these doomsday predictions caused little concern. And throughout the 1930s, as the development of rocket and jet propulsion systems began to suggest the potential for supersonic flight, the American aviation establishment lagged well behind its European rivals. Our technical grasp of aeronautics was deficient. We had really lost competitiveness with the European nations. World War II changed the picture. Speed became essential to air combat. 
Scrambling to catch up, the U.S. government poured money into the research and development of faster fighter planes, like the P-51 Mustang. But while executing sharp high-speed dives, pilots sometimes experienced a frightening loss of control. It would just start shaking. I mean, it just, they'd let you know that you were in an area you shouldn't be in. I used to hear from the fighter boys, that, you know, old Joe, a wing blew off and nobody was shooting at him. And they would come back and tell uh, the engineers uh, the plane froze up, the controls in a dive were unresponsive. Meanwhile, Germany launched its supersonic V-2 rocket in 1942. Two years later, the Luftwaffe were flying jets into combat. Had the war lasted longer, some believe that Germany's superior aviation technology might have changed its outcome. As we went through the rubble of Nazi Germany, we discovered how really narrow our technological victory over the Third Reich had been. We had missed in large measure the significance of high-speed flights. And it quickly became apparent that, you know, technology, industry was going to have to address this issue. Propelled by a sense of urgency in the wake of the war, the U.S. vowed to build an airplane to see if the sound barrier could be safely breached. But the magnitude of that ambition demanded cooperation from two powerful agencies, which didn't always see eye to eye. The National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, precursor to today's NASA, and the U.S. Army Air Forces. Though both groups agreed on the importance of the mission, they sharply disagreed on how to get there. There were two distinct points of view about how to go about the supersonic uh, project. The NACA traditionally felt that the best way of pursuing research was to do so incrementally. The Air Force appreciated this type of research, but they wanted as few delays as possible. In March of 1945, Bell aircraft owner Larry Bell agreed to construct a plane for the government, which would be safe and controllable up to 0.80 Mach a speed at the lower end of the transonic zone, and with enough power in reserve to fly beyond Mach 1. The airplane would be called the XS-1, X for experimental, S for sonic, and one to denote the first of its kind. With little evidence to suggest what kind of plane to build, Bell took a common sense approach, designing the nose of the fuselage in the shape of a 50 caliber bullet. They knew that the 50 caliber bullet, as a decelerated back through the speed of sound, had stable deceleration characteristics, and had relatively low drag. Bell also decided to use a rocket engine rather than a jet system to propel the airplane. Unlike a rocket with its self-contained fuel supply, turbojet engines draw air from the atmosphere for thrust, and those in development were not capable of maintaining sufficient thrust at high altitudes, where the XS-1 would be flown to take advantage of lower air resistance. Only rocket power would produce the type of power necessary to allow this plane to fully explore the transonic zone and perhaps go supersonic. Anticipating violent shockwaves near the sound barrier, Bell built the XS-1 to withstand 18 Gs, twice the strength of conventional fighter planes. Yet its wings, fortified by a skin of milled aluminum, were unusually thin to help maintain lift in the transonic zone. To further offset control problems at transonic speeds, the tail of the XS-1 was positioned higher than usual on the vertical fin. Another innovation called the Adjustable Horizontal Stabilizer allowed the pilot to manually adjust the pitch of the entire tail from inside the plane, creating, in effect, a movable tail. But if protecting the XS-1 from the elements was a priority, protecting its pilot was not. The cockpit had no ejection seat, and bailing out from the side entrance meant risking decapitation from the wings, which ran parallel to the door. There was no practical way to exit the airplane, uh, absolutely none whatsoever. Uh, as, as Chuck Yeager later on said, you know, I wore the parachute, but basically I wore it just to sit on because there's no way I could have gotten out of that airplane. Compounding the danger, contemporary wind tunnels, the usual method employed to predict an airplane's controllability at varying speeds, were not yet capable of giving accurate readings near the speed of sound. Wind tunnels were uh, surprisingly deficient. We really didn't quite know what was happening there. And so we'd use the sky basically as a laboratory. 
With so few scientific signposts, flying the XS-1 would require not just technical savvy, but raw courage. Hardened and tested by war, such pilots were readily at hand to accept the challenge. Olemme nyt todistamassa yhtä luonnon monista ihmeistä. Tässä ihminen ottaa käteensä palan Vaasan täyshyvät leipää. Tämä on se leipä, joka on leivottu kokonaan täyshyväviljasta. Katsokaa noita paahdettuja jyviä ja siemeniä. Mutta hetkinen, mitä nyt oikein tapahtuu? Tällaista ei ole ennen nähty. Tuon leivän täytyy olla todella hyvää ja runsaskuituista. Vaasan täyshyvät. Maista maukkaat uutuudet. Vuonna 2008 Somerolla syntyi 85 lasta. Somerolla asuu 55 sarja. Somerolla on yksi hotelli. Käänny oikealle myllypellon tielle. Sukko sulle antaa. No emme mekään nyt ihan kaikkea tiedä. Ja elämältä maistuu tää. Nolla kaksi fonekta Elina Hei. Salossa asuu 188 Heidiä. Tuossa noin 2,2 miljoonaa! Kymmeneltä nelosella. NCIS Los Angeles. Keskiviikkoisin yhdeksältä. Yhdestoista elokuuta alkaen nelosella. Okay, Mouse, Sarja esittää tuttujen hittisarjojen uudet, ennennäkemättömät jaksot. Syksyllä Jimillä. World War II was a conflict defined by air power. Dogfights over Europe were life and death battles that pushed pilots and planes to the limit. During dogfights, you'd go into high-speed dives or as fast as you could get the airplane going straight down from, you know, 36, 37,000 feet. And when this happened, a shock wave formed on the thickest part of the wing. And behind the shock wave, you had turbulent air. And it was just a nuisance if you're trying to track some guy to, to shoot him down. After the war ended, Chuck Yeager and Bob Hoover were among 125 Army Air Force pilots stationed at Ohio's right field. There they improved their skills flying American planes and captured German aircraft, which were brought there to test their flight characteristics. We were flying so many different types of airplanes in a given month that it would be incomprehensible to a, uh, an Air Force pilot nowadays. 
Jaeger and Hoover also attended Wright Field's flight test school. Army Air Force Colonel Albert Boyd, who ran the school, wished to expand the military's role in flight testing and development. He saw the need for test pilots to become not just proficient stick and rudder men, but proficient technically, to become true engineering test pilots. The Army Air Force has controlled the budget for the XS-1 project as well. But flight research was traditionally done by the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, along with private contractors. So when the first XS-1 was rolled out for its maiden flights at Florida's Pine Castle Field in January of 1946, Bell Aircraft directed the early tests with the assistance of the NACA. And it was a civilian pilot from Bell, Jack Woolhams, who flew the airplane. The NACA had the charter for flight research, the test pilots there at Wright Field, really kind of uh, fell into a secondary status. With the XS-1 rocket engine still in development, Jack Woolhams piloted 10 glide flights at Pine Castle. To do that, the XS-1 was lowered into a loading pit, where it was hoisted into the bomb bay of a B-29 by means of a standard bomb shackle. The B-29 was modified for the job by making cuts in its fuselage to accommodate the smaller plane, which was painted saffron orange to make it more visible. Then the B-29 flew to an altitude of 22,000 feet and dropped the XS-1 into the sky. The XS-1 performed well during the glide tests, but Florida's rainy weather, along with some minor landing mishaps, caused several delays and canceled flights. So in the summer of 1946, the government moved the XS-1 program from Pine Castle to Muroc Army Airfield in Southern California, a desert base whose main natural asset, Rogers Dry Lake, constituted an ideal landing field. But Jack Woolhams never made it to Muroc. In August of 1946, while testing his P-39 Cobra One race plane for an air show in Cleveland, he was killed in a crash. He was replaced in the XS-1 by another Bell pilot named Chalmers Slick Goodlin. Chalmers Slick Goodlin was an experienced uh, World War II pilot. He was young, 23, and he was known to be a good stick and rudder man. By December of 1946, the XS-1 rocket engine was ready for Slick Goodlin's first powered flight. The engine, which weighed only 208 pounds, was composed of four steel cylinders, each capable of generating 1,500 pounds of static thrust. The rocket fuel was a mixture of liquid oxygen and water-diluted ethyl alcohol. Before each flight, mechanics on the base would pump those propellants into separate spherical tanks located behind the cockpit. Pressurized nitrogen gas force-fed the propellants into the rocket chambers, where they could be ignited, either separately or all at once. Nitrogen was also used to pressurize the cockpit and to control the wing flaps and landing gear. The XS-1 was capable of a ground takeoff, which would allow the NACA to conduct a full range of flight tests. But the heavy and voluminous fuel supply system nearly doubled the weight of the plane, making an air launch the more practical option for reaching the sound barrier. This effectively cut the flying time of the X-1 at full power to two and a half minutes. With only two and a half minutes, that settled the issue. Flights at Muroc proceeded cautiously. The NACA had loaded the plane with 500 pounds of instrumentation and could measure data from 300 pressure points on the wing, making the XS-1 the most thoroughly instrumented plane of its time. We had instrumentation there that would show the stability and control of the airplane. We had instrumentation of what the pilot was doing. It was heavily loaded for a reason, because we looked at all of this data in order to predict what we did the next time. There's no point doing the flights just to do them, to say that you punch through the sound barrier if you don't have a clear trail of evidence that tells you how it happened. The NACA's record keeping was meticulous. After six months and 22 flights, Slick Goodland had flown the XS-1 to 0.82 Mach, the lower region of the transonic zone. But when the NACA predicted that at least 50 more flights would be necessary to challenge the sound barrier, the military became concerned about the pace of the program. 
They believed that breaking the barrier would have far-reaching consequences for future armed conflicts, and that whoever broke it first would gain the upper hand. There was a very strong recognition among the American military that when the war ended in 1945, a new war was about to begin, a war for technological supremacy in the post-World War II era. Bell Aircraft was worried as well. The company was being paid on a fixed contract basis, and time meant money. So in the spring of 1947, they submitted their own proposal to take over the next phase of testing, but with a guarantee that the government would pick up the costs of the program, no matter how long it took. Bell needed to resolve these issues very, very quickly, because if it didn't, its economic livelihood was going to be at stake. But military budgets had been slashed after the war, and the Bell proposal, which included a sizable flight bonus for its pilot, Slick Goodland, was rejected by the Army Air Forces as too expensive. It had been common practice since the 1930s for these uh, civilian contractor pilots to, to get bonuses for a first flight in an airplane or uh, some kind of highly risky flight or series of flights. It became an issue because the Army Air Forces didn't have any money. When Bell rejected the government's counteroffer, the Army Air Forces suddenly had an opportunity to take over the XS-1 program and move it along at a faster pace. But the stakes were high. The success or failure of the XS-1 could determine the extent of the military's involvement in future flight research. With so much riding on the outcome of the program, the choice of which military pilot would fly the XS-1 became crucial. That decision fell to Wright Field's Colonel Boyd. Boyd was faced with what he later called one of the most important and difficult decisions he had to make. So he has to pick an airman to fly this airplane who's responsible, but who is not overly cautious. And the pick he makes is Chuck Yeager. And what impressed him so much about Yeager was the fact that he had this remarkable uh, ability. Uh, Hemingway called it grace under pressure. The priorities were, as Colonel Boyd laid him down, he said, get the airplane above Mach 1 as soon as you can, and you know, don't, don't kill yourself and don't embarrass the Air Force. Boyd picked Yeager's close friend, 25-year-old Bob Hoover, as his backup pilot. He said, do you know Chuck Yeager? And I said, yes, sir, I certainly do. He said, well, what do you think of him? I said, he's the best aviator I've ever seen. Boyd selected a 32-year-old pilot and Caltech graduate named Jack Ridley as the XS-1 flight engineer. Yeager and Ridley quickly formed a tight bond. Ridley was a technical guy very well educated and he understood technology much much more than i did and colonel boyd really saw that here ridley is my brain on these deals that i really didn't understand and he knew he'd keep me straight in the summer of 1947 jaeger ridley and hoover traveled to the bell plant in niagara falls for their first close look at the xs1 the airplane was small about 30 feet long and 10 feet high, but powerful. They flipped the switch, ignited one rocket, and Christ, it made a hell of a noise, and some of the plaster shook off the roof. It was pretty impressive. Colonel Boyd dispatched 27-year-old B-29 pilot Roberto Cardenas and his flight engineer Edward Swindell, 31, to join Jaeger's team at Muroc. Along with Bell project engineer Dick Frost, 29, these young men, all under the age of 40, would determine the fate of the XS-1. You find a group of people here who were unified and who worked together extraordinarily well. But even as the newly assembled flight team prepared to take over the XS-1, scientists were still debating whether the sound barrier could be conquered at all. Several months before, British test pilot Geoffrey de Havilland son of the founder of England's de Havilland Aircraft Company, had been killed when his plane disintegrated while training to break the world speed record in a dive, a crash attributed to the effects of transonic shockwaves. But the members of the newly formed XS-1 team would not be easily dissuaded from their task. We were fearless, I think. It's about the best way to describe it. I mean, I, I can withstand anything. And that's the attitude you had during the war, when you'd see people getting shot down all around you. I wouldn't say that Chuck was fearless. It's just that he knew fear. 
he knew fear. He knew how to handle fear. By July of 1947, Jaeger and the rest of the XS-1 team had moved out to the California desert. The final push toward the sound barrier was about to begin. It was crucial to make a good contract for Kimi at the beginning of his career. And in 2001, we made the most important deal for his future. That's when we changed to DNA. As you say in Finland, Hoplo, koko perheen seikkailupuisto. Nyt rajoitukset on leikkiaika ja alle yksivuotiaat ilmaiseksi. Olla. Kovai eikö olla? Siinäpä vasta kysymys. Faija, mitä sä oikein teet? Harjoittele. Äiti haluaa kotiteatteri. On miehiä, jotka ampuvat aina ohi. Ja on miehiä, jotka lukevat mikrobittiä. Nyt puoleen hintaan. Fatser Vilpuri esittää. Uusi terveellinen pikkuruis. Fatser Vilpuri, lapsille leivottu ruisleipä, jossa yhdistyy hyvä maku ja terveellisyys. Toimiiko se? Anna nähdä. Plus TVn oma paketti on todellinen lomapaketti. Tilaa ja osallistu mahtavaan kesäkisaan osoitteessa www.plustv.fi. Women get bored easily. New axe twist. The fragrance that changes. New axe twist. Also in shower gel. Uusi tajunnan räjäyttävä sketsisarja. On kiva luotto. <tos> Mitä toimii se? Luotolle tietysti se ei toimi missään muualla. Testosteriili. Osoitteessa ruutu.fi. Otto. Suora lonkero. Tuli ympäriltä, mitä isommaksi liekit kasvo. Se oli meidän ainut keino pelastua. No eihän kukaan nyt sydänkohtausta odota. Tää ainakaan Ruotsin laivalla. Tuli paikalle tosi nopeasti. Pelastushelikopteri lokakuussa. Cold War 
tensions rising after World War II, the U.S. was determined to keep the XS-1 program under wraps, and Muroc Army Airfield, a rugged outpost in a sparsely populated desert, was the ideal location for a project shrouded in secrecy. Muroc at the time was harsh and primitive and isolated. To give an example, they would put down bales of hay and they would lace it with barbed wire to keep rattlesnakes out of buildings. And in a way, it gave a certain spirit to the place and a desire to concentrate on the work. Chuck Yeager's first XS-1 flight at Muroc on August 6, 1947, an unpowered glide test, set the routine for those to follow. After the XS-1 was shackled to the B-29, piloted by Roberto Cardenas, Yeager flew with the crew to an altitude of 7,000 feet. There, he entered the XS-1 by descending a sliding lift into the open air and squeezing into the cockpit. At 25,000 feet, flight engineer Jack Ridley released the shackle, dropping the XS-1 into the sky. It's very smooth and quiet, very strong airplane, 18 Gs, positive or negative. And uh, my first glide flight, I mean, man, this thing is really neat. Consequently, after three glide flights, it, you know, I, I had no no qualms about doing anything I wanted to with the airplane. But the military mission to put the XS-1 on a fast track put Jaeger and Jack Ridley at odds with Walt Williams, the head of the NACA flight test unit, who wished to proceed more cautiously. Walt Williams at one point told me, you're going too fast, you're a bunch of cowboys, you're going to kill Chuck, you're going to ruin the airplane. Williams, man, is, is kind of a... A very arrogant individual. And the only time I ever seen him shut up was when Jack Ridley opened his mouth. Then he listened. There was a solution to the conflict. Bell had built two XS-1 planes. The NACA was granted authority to fly the 6063 plane through a full range of flight tests, while the Army Air Forces used the 6062 plane to push toward the sound barrier. Though the two planes looked nearly identical, Jaeger's airplane had slightly thinner wings than the NACA airplane. Thinner wings meant better lift and faster speed, and Jaeger and Ridley were ready to make the most of it. We're not here you know, to get data for NACA. We're to get this airplane above Mach 1, and I think that's the way at least Ridley and I looked at it. Underscoring his team's control of the program, Jaeger inscribed the nose of the 6062 plane, Glamorous Glennis, after his wife. Jaeger had done the same in World War II and figured it would bring him good luck. I'm the only guy flying the airplane, and I could almost say it's my airplane, but it isn't, and I was the only guy flying it. I said, I'll put her name on it. Jaeger's first powered flight of the XS-1 on August 27th was both skillful and daring. After piloting the plane to 0.82 Mach on just one rocket chamber and leveling off at about 40,000 feet, the goal of the flight plan he went a step beyond by diving the airplane to 2,700 feet above the base, initiating a climb, then firing all four chambers. And man, it really went straight up, and I got up to 8.5. Well, the airplane flew good, and I, I didn't have any qualms about doing it. By speeding to 0.85 Mach in his first powered flight, Jaeger had flown the XS-1 faster than ever before and sent a message that the sound barrier was in his sights. Chuck was pretty meticulous about what he did. Uh, it, it, it looked like he was taking chances, but uh, it really wasn't. He'd, he'd thought things pretty well. But the XS-1 was still dangerous at any speed. Scraping the low-slung plane on the ground during takeoff could easily spark an explosion. Once in the air, Jaeger had to carefully monitor the regulators, which controlled pressure levels in the rocket chambers. The margin between what was needed for maximum thrust and what could rupture the chambers was extremely narrow, just five pounds of pressure per square inch. If you let those pressures get away from you, you blow up. I, I mean, that, that took a lot of your attention. Everything was very close to the red line. Everything we did was very close to the red line because in order to get the thrust out of the engine. Nonetheless, Jaeger pushed the XS-1 briskly toward Mach 1. When he reached 0.88 Mach on his second fueled flight, a speed well past the realm of wind tunnel tests, the plane began to be buffeted by shock waves. 
But since it was still controllable, Jaeger pressed forward. By his sixth flight, he was flying at 0.92 Mach and racing past Bob Hoover's fleet FP-80 chase plane as if it were standing still. And then he'd go by me, and I was sitting there at 8 tenths Mach number, and he was going by faster and faster each time. But on October 10th, Jaeger's eighth flight, he pushed the XS-1 to an indicated speed of 0.94 Mach and suddenly lost control of the airplane. And I pulled back on the control, nothing happened. The airplane went to where it was headed, and the control just flopped back and forth. Jaeger finally regained control after the airplane slowed down and landed it safely. And I came down and told Ridley, I said, man, we got a problem. The mood on the ground was glum. NACA data showed that when the XS-1 reached 0.94 Mach, a shockwave began to slam directly against the hinge point of the elevator on the tail, freezing its mobility and thus removing Jaeger's ability to control the pitch of the plane. Since aerodynamicists believed that the impact of hitting the sound barrier would force the nose of a plane up or down, pitch control was essential. Without it, the XS-1 was too dangerous to fly. Colonel Boyd thought the project might be doomed. Colonel Boyd came out and said, you know, what's your problem? He said, we got a big problem, Colonel. And he said, to Ridley, what are you going to do about it? And Ridley said, I think, let's give us a day to work this thing out. Jack Ridley noted that Bell Aircraft had built an extra control authority into the XS-1, the adjustable horizontal stabilizer, or movable tail. By operating a toggle switch in the cockpit, a talented pilot could actually tilt the entire tail a few degrees, up or down, perhaps enough to keep the plane under control while traveling through the transonic zone. The adjustable stabilizer had never been tested as a means of control in high-speed flight, but with the XS-1 project on the line, Ridley figured it was time to do just that. Jack Ridley said, look, I think you might be able to control the airplane if you move the tail in very small increments. The solution was readily at hand. Now, how that would actually work was not a foregone conclusion. Jack Ridley firmly believed that Jaeger could use the stabilizer to guide the XS-1 through the sound barrier, and Jaeger believed in Ridley. We were damn fools if you're going to smoke out beyond 9-4 and not have any ability to control the airplane. Ridley said, you know, I think if this will be a crude way to control the airplane, but if you can handle it, this thing will take you through Mach 1. The fate of the XS-1 was far from certain. The next flight would tell the story. Vitalinean juotava jogurtti on herkullinen ja vähäkalorinen välipala. Ja se on helppo ottaa mukaan. Vitalinea, niin hyvää, niin kevyttä. Jää paitsi on vaan vaihda autosi uuteen Kiaan. Deltasta saat nyt tarjouksen, jollaista et ole ennen nähnyt. Saat tiepalvelun ja kahden vuoden huolenpitosopimuksen kaupan päälle. Sekä lahjaksi laadukkaan jalkapallon, kun pyydät tarjouksen. Delta-autosta. Lotus Emilia. Niin imukykyinen, että vain yksi arkki riittää. Vain yksi arkki riittää. Nyt urku auki! Mika, Mika, Mika! Valkea koski Suomi, Finland! Täältä pesee! Oi, oi, oi! Hirmuinen tälli! Kisa ratkeaa viimeisessä mutkassa! MotoGP, laji, joka ratkaistaan radalla. Tsekin GP, suorana. Lue lisää sportin sivuilta. Vuonna 1919 otettiin Helsingin rautatieaseman äärellä käyttöön Suomen ensimmäinen välipalaautomaatti. Tämä hieno laite pahtoi kahvipavut ja valmisti herkullista kahvia kupillisen kerrallaan. Lisäksi se valmisti voileipiä. Totta vai tarua? Asialliset välipalat RLtä myös tänään.
Leffaputkessa perjantaina. Clueless. Ow, get off of me. Ah, oh, as if. Lauantaina. Kauna. Ja sunnuntaina. Sahara. How many times am I gonna have to save your ass? Well, in case you didn't know this, I actually saved yours. Viikonlopun leffaputki nelosella. Afrikan matkalla me reissettiin Addis Abebasta Lounais-Etiopiaan autolla, niin meillä oli kolmen vuorokauden kestävä automatka Savannin viidakon ja, ja vuoriston läpi ja päästiin semmoisen paikkaan, missä asuu suri heimo. Tämä kipinä lähti BBCn ohjelmasta, olisiko se ollut tuo Tribe-ohjelma, jossa yksi kaveri kiertää maailmalla ja asuu eri heimojen kanssa ja, ja silloin mä näin ton, niin mä ajattelin, että tonne on pakko mennä. Et jos ikinä tehdään matkaohjelmaa, niin tonne pitää mennä. Ja sitten myöhemmin tuli matkaohjelma ja sitten me alettiin säätää sitä. Se oli ihan niinku käsittämättömän ison duunin takana, koska me ollaan varmaan ihan viimeisiä kuvausryhmiä, ketä hallitus on päästänyt sinne. Ja tota, meidänkään ei olisi pitänyt saada sitä keppitaistelua kuvattua eikä arbitatuointeja. Mutta tota, koska se oli silloin kielletty ja, ja meillä on hallituksen lupa päästä, se kesti puoli vuotta saada tämä. tämä ja, ja siellä ei pitänyt tapahtua sitä, mutta ne järjesti sen meille kuitenkin, koska ne itse haluaa tehdä sitä. Ja tu tiesit sen, tulee kuvausryhmä, ei saa tehdä arbitatuointeja eikä saa olla tätä tappelujuttua. Mutta, mutta silti kun päästiin sinne, niin totta kai ne halusi näyttää. After Chuck Yeager's frightening loss of control in the XS1 at 0.94 Mach, his team placed their bets on a previously untested control called the Adjustable Horizontal Stabilizer. If it worked, Yeager could keep control of his plane's longitudinal direction, or pitch, at high-speed flight. If it failed, the XS1 might be doomed, along with its pilot. If you're going to go supersonic, by God, you better have longitude control. I mean, that's a real solid thing. If he was not going to have full control of the plane and something were to happen while crossing that, that sound barrier, uh, well, there was going to be a big problem. Chuck, very definitely, he was the guy that was going to suffer the most if it didn't work. Two nights before the make-or-break flight of the XS-1, Jaeger and his wife Glynis went to dinner at Poncho's, a popular watering hole and horse ranch run by a close friend named Poncho Barnes. Poncho was a former aviatrix, who had once taken the women's world speed record from Amelia Earhart. She kept a standing offer of a free steak dinner for the pilot who broke the sound barrier. Poncho's, who's a wonderful old gal who loved military test pilots and hated civilian test pilots because of the pay difference, you know. And she was a very generous woman. And when Glennis and I first came out here in 47 with the kids, she let us stay there in the motel for, and wouldn't charge us a penny. She was very generous to us. But my goodness, she either liked you or she didn't like you. And I'm sure glad I was on the liking side of her. After dinner that night, Jaeger and his wife rode Poncho's horses through the desert. But while racing back to the ranch, Jaeger saw too late that someone had closed the gate. I hit the fence with my horse, missed the gate, flipped and landed on my right side and, and broke a couple ribs. And that was on Sunday night and the flight was on Tuesday. Knowing that he'd be grounded from flying the XS-1 if he went to the base hospital, Jaeger secretly sought treatment in a nearby town. I went to a veterinarian in, in Roseman. He said, you got two broken ribs, and taped me up and said, that was it. This before uh, the most uh, important flight of his career uh, certainly was an unsettling experience. He was fearful that if, uh, if there was word of this leaked out beyond the flight line, they might take him off the plane. Since his controls in the cramped cockpit of the XS-1 were within easy reach, Jaeger believed he could still fly the airplane in spite of the broken ribs. But closing the cockpit door, which required pulling the handle forward from inside the hatch, would be too painful. To solve the problem, Jack Ridley sawed off a broomstick handle for Jaeger to employ as a lever to lock the door. The lever locked the door on the inside. I couldn't do it in the right arm. I could stick the broomstick between the two notches like this and 
and clank it shut. By the morning of October 14th, as the XS-1 prepared for takeoff, NACA data revealed that Jaeger had actually reached a speed of 0.997 Mach on his previous flight, nearly the speed of sound. There was no longer doubt that Jaeger could reach the sound barrier. The only mystery left was what would happen when he did. Once more, the B-29 carried the XS-1 up to 7,000 feet. There, despite severe pain, Jaeger descended the lift and slid into the open hatch. With Ridley positioning the door from above, he leveraged the broomstick handle to lock it into place. At 20,000 feet, the countdown began. His transmission transcript uh, says it all. When Jack Ridley says, are you ready? He said, hell yes, let's get it over with. After dropping from the B-29, Jaeger fired the XS-1 and bolted away. Buffeted by shockwaves at 0.88 Mach, he began toggling the stabilizer switch to adjust the pitch of the tail. His maneuvers worked well enough to counter shockwaves and keep the plane under control. You know, he had to be flying this airplane. He had to keep the pressure regulators even, and then on top of that, let's sit there and fly this horizontal tail with a little toggle switch there. Uh, he was pretty busy. After flying to the usual altitude of 42,000 feet on two rocket chambers, Jaeger leveled out, opened a third chamber, and accelerated toward the sound barrier. Then, at 0.98 Mach, the needle on his Mach meter suddenly dropped off the scale, a subtle but unmistakable sign that the XS-1 had surpassed the speed of sound. It was a surprise when the Mach meter jumped off the scale, a big surprise, because we didn't know we were going to get a Mach 1 that day. By flying supersonic, the XS-1 was pushing through sound waves before they could return to buffet the airplane, thus entering a new realm of smooth gliding flight. Once you were on the other side, you had a whole new world. The X-1 just continued to perform smoothly. And what you realized was that what we really had was not a, a sonic barrier in the sky, but an informational barrier. As Jaeger shot past the sound barrier, his achievement was confirmed by a related phenomenon, a sonic boom. A sonic boom is actually two booms, which occur in rapid succession. The first is caused by the front of the plane sharply separating the waves in its path. The second occurs after the rear of the plane passes through, and sound waves return to fill the vacuum in its wake. You have a series of compressions. You can see two here very clearly. We have one off the nose and one off the wing here. The same thing happens on the backside, except it's a recompression. We have an expansion on the back where the flow speeds back up because the aircraft is no longer there. So you have a second boom at the back end of the airplane. And all these little compressions tend to pile up at the front, and all the little compressions at the back tend to pile up at the back. And that gives us the characteristic baboom that you get with a sonic boom. The sound barrier had been conquered, not with a bang, but with the sound of a distant boom. The wall many thought was unbreakable turned out to be largely a construct of ignorance and fear. You have a feeling of accomplishment because that, that's what you were assigned to do. And Ridley was happy and, uh, and Hoover and the rest of the guys. I latched onto him as soon as he ran out of fuel. And I said, Part, I think we're getting that free steak dinner tonight at Poncho's. Jaeger wasn't the only one due for congratulations. Jack Ridley's flight plan had gone off precisely as he predicted it would, marking a fundamental shift in the scientific knowledge of high-speed flight. When I parked in front of base operations, B-29, there were a bunch of guys waiting for us. They didn't particularly want to talk to me. They wanted to talk to Jackie. And uh, one of them symbolically took a textbook like he had, and he threw it in the can, and he said, Jackie, let's go rewrite the book. Though Jaeger's flight was a defining moment in aviation history, the news was initially kept secret from the public for reasons of national security. Two months later, though, the story leaked out. Six months after that, in June of 1948, the triumph of the XS-1 was officially confirmed in a White House ceremony. President Truman awarded the prestigious Collier Trophy to the NACA's John Stack, Chuck Yeager, and Larry Bell, acknowledging the collaboration of the three agencies which drove the project forward. 
But while their mission was a success, it was only the first shot fired in a technological revolution which would rapidly change the world. The triumphant flight of the XS-1 in October of 1947 led to a revolution in aviation technology. The United States took the lead and other countries hastened to catch up. The development of increasingly powerful jet engines, along with the aerodynamic lessons learned from the XS-1, ushered in a new era of high-speed flight for commercial and military planes alike. In 1949, Chuck Yeager again broke the sound barrier, this time in a unique ground launch of the XS-1. But while both Yeager and his airplane had become famous, the key ingredient to the success of the XS-1, the adjustable horizontal stabilizer, was kept secret for years. That policy paid off for the United States when American F-86 Sabres squared off against Soviet-made MiGs during the Korean War. The American pilots held a 10 to 1 edge in aerial combat, an advantage many experts attributed to the adjustable stabilizer. As MiGs were turning and losing control effectiveness at high speeds, the Sabre's control effectiveness was actually being considerably enhanced. Many, many kills of MiGs were made at that higher Mach number, uh, reflecting the contributions, really, of what came out of the X-1 program. Somebody would have eventually broken the sound barrier. The fact that the United States was first has made a huge difference in air power and, and where we stand. For the NACA, whose scientific expertise laid the groundwork for the assault on the sound barrier, success would lead to funding for increasingly complex research. As its mission evolved in size and scope, the NACA grew into the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, the agency which would ultimately land a man on the moon. As Wright Field's Colonel Boyd had hoped, the triumph of the XS-1 became the catalyst for the military to take the lead in flight research and development programs. By the early 1950s, once sleepy Muroc had been transformed into Edwards Air Force Base, home to 10,000 military personnel. Today, Edwards and the nearby NASA Dryden Research Center remain at the epicenter of flight research and development. The X-1 program was very important in terms of building or initiating this very fruitful collaboration between the Air Force and the NACA and later NASA because it firmly established this location as the premier flight test location in the world. A cavalcade of increasingly sophisticated supersonic craft were tested at Edwards and Dryden in the wake of the XS-1. In 1953, Chuck Yeager set a speed record of Mach 2.5 while flying the X-1A. In 1956, the X-2 pushed the speed record to Mach 3.2. In the 1960s, the X-15 climbed to 354,000 feet, or 67 miles, essentially flying to space and back at a top speed of more than six Mach. In 1965, the XB-70 Valkyrie sustained high supersonic flight for 74 minutes. The next year, the legendary Blackbird, the SR-71, entered service to begin more than 20 years of high-altitude spy missions. In the early 1970s, supersonic F-15 Eagles set new standards for air-to-air -air combat and precision ground strikes. The Martin Marietta X-24B lifting body, an experimental wingless craft introduced in 1973, validated the approach and landing techniques later employed by the space shuttle. And in 1977, the successful air launch of the Enterprise introduced the prototype craft for the space shuttle itself. We have mastered the supersonic regime very, very well. We have gone from merely penetrating it to actually thriving in it. The airplanes have changed. The uh, facilities have changed greatly. Uh, about the only two things that haven't changed is that lake bed that's sitting out there and uh, the people who fly the airplanes. Breaking the barrier many deemed unbreakable, the XS-1 proved the most significant event in aviation since the Wright brothers first took flight at Kitty Hawk take a look back on the history of flight over the last hundred years, we find that there were some great challenges. The greatest challenge of all was to master 
the transonic and supersonic environment. And that's what the X-1 gave to us. Well, I was the right place, the right time, at the right age, and had the, right, had the capability of uh, taking advantage of it. It's that simple. But if Jaeger's goal was simply defined, his mission was profound. Braced by the courage of pilots to face an unknown destiny, the triumphant flight of the XS-1 marked the end of an era in the history of aviation and the beginning of another. Esittää tuttujen hittisarjojen uudet, ennennäkemättömät jaksot. Syksyllä Jimillä. Keskiolut tuli Järren valikoimaan vuonna 1995. Samana vuonna ilmestyi Järry Kottonissa tarina, jossa Järry panee suomalaisen rikollisen rautoihin, ostaa Rältä kasipakin ja lähtee saunaan. Totta vai tarua? Ja hyvä tarina jatkuu. Nyt Rältä kahdeksan tölkin pakki karhua, 1195. Lootus Emilia. Niin imukykyinen, että vain yksi arkki riittää. Vain yksi arkki riittää. Kireen olo vatsassa. Tuli syötyä eri lailla. Eikä nyt kiireessä ehdi syödä kunnolla. Se on ihan tuttua. Sulla on hidas ruoansulatus. Oletko kokeillut aktivia? Yksi päivässä ja parin viikon päästä on jo paljon helpompi olla. Aktivia tutkitusti helpottaa ruoansulatusvaivoja, kuten turvotuksen tunnetta. Maista. Ruoansulatusvaivaa. Aktivia auttaa. Ollakko vai eikö olla? Siinäpä vasta. Pysytkö uuden tekniikan tasalla? Pysy. Lue mikrobitti. Nyt puoleen hintaan. Hyvä ei saa halvalla. Parhaan saa. Testivoittaja Leon. Iso farkku Altea XL. TDI-juhlamallit. Nyt erikoishintaan. Autoemotion. On this episode of Street Customs. 
Christian Adiger is a fashion designer. Okay, so let's do it. Basically, I'm going to get a military.